So you must know the candidates in the election of 1824. I'm sure you remember that Monroe was elected in 1816, that he was re-elected in 1820 without opposition. 1824, there were four candidates for the presidency. One of them was Henry Clay, our old buddy, right, who was the champion of the American system. Another was um, uh, William Crawford, another old friend of ours, who was the seated Secretary of Treasury. One was John Quincy Adams, who was the seated, at the time, Secretary of State. And the other was Andrew Jackson, who was the hero of the Battle of New Orleans. What candidate did the Electoral College choose to be president in 1824? John Quincy. No. No. Oh. None of them. Good try. Oh, yeah. None of them. Remember uh, that in that election, the Electoral College there was not um, Jackson got 99 electoral votes. I think John Quincy Adams got 87, 84, some amount less than that. Uh, Crawford had, you know, in, in the 30s, and then, and then uh, the least was Henry Clay. And because Jackson did not get an electoral majority, then the, the election went into the House of Representatives, where they voted by state. What happened now, Olivia? in the House of Representatives. John Quincy Adams. Now, John Quincy Adams wins, and who did he appoint to be his Secretary of State? Mike? Henry Clay. Henry Clay. <laughs> uh -huh. And what did, what did the, the opponents of John Quincy Adams and Clay call that appointment? A evidence of what? Go ahead, dear McMurchie. Evidence that a... Uh, uh, it was a rigged election. They called it something particular, a corrupt, a corrupt bargain. So the corrupt bargain was the idea that in return for Clay's support in Congress, uh, John Quincy Adams appointed him Secretary of State, which in essence was naming his successor. Now, this kind of taints the John Quincy Adams administration. And we said that John Quincy Adams' administration is not really as successful. He has a lot of you know, liabilities. You know, he is not a very, you know, ingratiating person. He's a poor politician. He is not going to pander kind of to people. He has a nationalistic agenda that seems to be out of touch with the direction of the, uh, of the country. All of this results in him not having much success. The Jacksonians take over, you know, both houses of Congress in 1826, which sets the stage for Jackson's election in 1828. Now, when Jackson is elected, you know, we, we, we said he has this kind of ruckus uh, inauguration. What did we, we suggest the, that inauguration, this, this inaugural ball, and all these people coming in uh, to Washington to see Jackson to be inaugurated, what did that kind of say reflected something about Jackson? You know, and his ideology. So, uh, you know, this, this reckless kind of um, inaugural scene, if you want to call it that. What did that reflect in terms of what we think about in Jackson? Go ahead. What's the bad news for the people of Boston? Yes, the common people had kind of taken over the power of that. And then, you know, once Jackson was elected, we talked a lot about things that happened in Jackson's administration. We talked about the spoil slit system slash rotation in office. What do we mean by that? When we say spoil system slash rotation in office, what did Jackson do that was either controversial or you know defended by Jackson? Go ahead, Oda. Yes, he replaced um, appointees of other presidents with people that were loyal to himself. He defends it as rotation in office. Others are critical, call it the spoil system, and something that was intended to enhance his own power, depending upon your perspective of Jackson. And incidentally, I think reading those papers, I don't know that anyone has 
to come to the defense of Jackson or the Jacksonians. No, I mean, not even in, in, in any one of the categories. You know, not even like no one has even said, to my knowledge, yet, maybe one person has said, well, maybe he did defend political democracy. You know, maybe they were defenders of political No, everybody, no, 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 no. Right? You know, um, so, so there was, I hope it was not me that the prejudice you against, against Jackson. They did. I must not have gotten to it. But I mean, you had the remedy, the remedy piece, and remedy was clearly kind of supportive of Jackson and that. So, um, one of the big things that that happens in Jackson's first term, besides these these issues with appointments and with his cabinet, is the, the Indian removal, right? Now, in terms of Indian removals, what's what's the what's the problem? You know, what's the what's the problem, and what is Jackson's solution? So what's the problem in terms of you know, the issue of Indian removal? And what is Jackson's solution to the problem? Um, go ahead. Go ahead. The Indians are like taking up possible opportunities for land and expansion in like the Western territory. So he decided to just have all the Indians move. If you give them territory in Oklahoma, that wasn't really good territory. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's a nice synopsis. The, the, the Indians were in land that, that, that Georgians in particular wanted to occupy. And rather than allow those Indians to stay there and to deal with the state of Georgia, which John Marshall had said had no standing in those Indian lands, Jackson decides that he is going to, to forcibly remove those Indians to Oklahoma. And um, you know, we call that forcible removal, the whole thing, the trail of tears. Um, you know, the Indians that were, were, that were in, you know, the Cherokee in particular, particular in the Creek had some level of civilization. You know, one of the, one of the, the earliest kind of um, Indian legislation said, and I'm sure you read this, that if the Native Americans adopt kind of the white man ways and, in, 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 you know, assimilate into the white culture, then they can stay, right? Well, the Cherokee and the Creek had, had done that. You know, they had, you know, in their, in their, in their um, reservations, they had, you know, their own alphabet. And remember, the, the sure sign that they were civilized is the Cherokee actually owned slaves, right? You know, so, you know, to, to, to uh, you know, to kind of compare to that, you know, it's the sure sign of civilization they actually owned slaves. So they, they kind of felt betrayed because they had done their part in adopting, you know, what was described as civilization and, you know, they were still forced to be Now, um, a big issue in the Jackson administration was tariffs. And the Tariff of Abominations was passed in 1828, which actually was prior to Jackson taking office, because he didn't take office until 29. Um, in terms of protective tariff, what section of the country was the most supportive of protective tariff, and what was the most opposed? Go ahead, Mike. The North was most supportive and South was least supportive. Yes, I and mean, I think that's fair to say that New England, the hub of manufacturing, eventually they are going to be the most supportive of tariffs, and the least supportive of tariffs is the South. And remember, the Cotton South, the Plantation South, you know, led by John Calhoun, is even going to bring the country to the brink of, of civil war over tariffs. And remember, Calhoun is going to, to, to present his argument against the federal government's um, authority to even pass protective tariffs and the authority of states to stop them in something called the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. And the South Carolina Exposition and Protest was Calhoun's argument for ultimately the rights of states. That states have rights. And one of those rights is to stop laws that they believe the federal government that passed that they believe to be unconstitutional. And remember, Calhoun lays out this notion of nullification in the South Carolina Exposition and Protest. And we said that, that South Carolina actually does it. They, they, they nullify federal law in 1833, which leads to a showdown between Congress, in Jackson and South Carolina. Um, and eventually leads to a, a, a compromise that lowers tariffs 
and you know, results in South Carolina receiving their original uh, nullification, but, but nullifying the force bill nonetheless. And we said, you know, as a result of that, you know, it's kind of ambiguous as to who was the victor in this. And we, we actually debated that. We said, well, you know, who won this? And some of you still thought that Jackson won, and some of you thought that, that South Carolina won, and you said your textbook thought that the, the Union won, and some of you wouldn't wait until the conversation was over. But, I mean, we had that, you know, that discussion, um, you know, um, as well. And then, then we said in the second term, you know, the big issue for Jackson is the bank veto. And there's several questions on the test about it. I mean, there's actually a fair amount of questions on the test about the bank veto. Um, there's questions about what the bank did. It was the depository of, of the federal government. The government kept its money there. It loaned money to banks and businesses. But also was a repository for power. And this was something that Jackson um, doesn't like. And he vetoes the bank bill in this dramatic kind of veto message where he argues that the bank is a bad idea, it's unconstitutional, it's, it's, it's unfair. I mean, he's a multitude of arguments that, uh, as to why he justified his bank veto. But then in the aftermath, to make it even worse, he tries to kill the bank by withdrawing government funds. And it ends up in him being censured by the Senate for, for what they, they consider to be unconstitutional action. Now, Jackson's bank veto, as well as um, some of the other, what some people considered high-handed actions of, of Jackson, results in the, in the formation of an opposition party. And the opposition party to Jackson was the National Republicans that supported Henry Clay in 1832, but eventually the opposition party to Jackson started to call themselves the Whigs. And the Whigs were the traditional party in England against the king. And they, they, they formed a party that basically unified behind opposition to Jackson. We are actually going to talk about that a little bit tomorrow. But, but eventually, we are going to talk about, you know, kind of, you know, after we get done talking about the abolition, you know, we're going to talk a little bit about, you know, by the time the election of 40 rolls around, the Whig and the Democratic Party are, are kind of modern parties in the sense that we know today. They're supporting, you know, candidates and platforms and they have conventions and they have, you know, max appeal and they have, you know, speakers and parties and picnics and other ways of getting the vote out to support candidates. And so kind of modern electioneering and campaigning is something that emerges in the Jacksonian era. And the Whig opposition is going to adopt the same things that the Jacksonians do. Now, okay, we, we, we talked a lot about Jackson, and obviously there'll be questions on the test out of chapter 13, but we also had a discussion about, you know, the, 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 the rise of the, the market economy and manufacturing and the changes that occurred in the, um, in the United States, the transformation. And we just most recently put on the board, you know, um, a list of all the changes, westward expansion, Right, um, you know, urbanization, immigration, um, industrialization, and we talked a little bit about those. And in terms of one of the things we talked about was urbanization. And what urbanization means is more and more people are moving into or migrating to cities. And one of the trends of this time period, one of the transformations, was an increase in population in urban areas. Another one of the trends was um, a, a, a significant immigration of migrants from Ireland and Germany at this time. Right? So we talked at length about the Irish immigration. And, and what were some of the distinctive characteristics about the Irish immigrants? Besides their large number, we said there were a couple of things. Yes? Yes, they were poor. Right? Yes. Yes, and they were Catholic. So they were poor Catholics that came in large numbers. And remember we said they were so impoverished that oftentimes they could not get out of the cities where they came to. 
which created kind of an impression that there were more Irish than there actually were. Because where the Irish were, they were there in large numbers. Right? Where the Irish weren't, they weren't there at all. Right? So they, they, they were in New York, and they were in Philadelphia, and they were in Boston in large numbers, but they never made it into the hinterlands. But their, 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 their numbers and their poverty and their Catholicism are going to create a backlash. There are going to be lots of people in, in the United States that become fearful of this immigration. And the backlash, the term that we use to describe the backlash is nativism, right? You know, that people are going to say, hmm, this is a distortion for what we perceive as being America. America for Americans, and the Irish aren't Americans, right? And they never can be, because their religion, they have a different set of rules and a different set of laws, and they'll never, ever, ever adopt Republican institutions and values. Which is really ironic, you know. I mean, to, to, to suspect that. But I mean, people were, were genuinely believed that at the time, and it results in this nativism. And we also said, besides the Irish immigration, and there are several questions on the test about this, um, there was also this German immigration, which was different, because the Germans, in many cases, were not fleeing a famine or coming because they were impoverished. In many cases, they were coming because of autocratic rule, conscription, which is the draft, wars and other problems and disruptions in, in Europe. And so they weren't really coming for the same reasons. And um, you know, the German immigrants, who were large in number as well, you know, they had uh, more money. And so they tended to migrate in, you know, into, the, into the interior of the country more frequently. But they did set up communities and made, you know, um, also kind of an influence as well. Um, you know, then we said probably one of the biggest things that, that is a transformation in this time is industrialization. What was the first type of, of manufacturing that we said which is going to be prominent in the United States? Early, yes, go ahead. Textile. Textile. And where was the first textile manufacturing firm? Provincial. Now, Providence? Paw Tucket. Uh, Paw Tucket. Because guess who is from Paw Tucket to Rhode Island? James Watson, our fictional character that we are writing about. As fate would have it, Danielle, I received an email from the um, archivist of the Rhode Island Historical Society. She's going to send me some sources about uh, Paul Tucker. Uh, yeah, there we go. It's not all always, I'm always thinking about you kids. Oh, yeah. I can't rest. I, I'm, I'm just continuing. The wife will say, what's wrong? I have to think about those people. Right? I want them to have sources so that they can write and, 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 James Watson. and James Watson. And so yes, she sent me she sent me something by mail. She also emailed me something. Like share. Ooh. Ooh. So I'm thinking yes. about it. So, so anyways, yes, Pontucket Rhode Island. And, and, and who was the first who did we mention as, as, as kind of the, the first guy to do it? The first guy to to um, to, to build that text? Uh, Samuel Slater. Samuel Slater is often considered to be the father of the uh, factory system in the United States. He's the one that builds the first, has the plans for the first textile mill that is located in Pawtucket, Rhode Island. I mean, what, 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 what did you mention? We mentioned it today. Eli Whitney is also, ah, uh, yes, the cotton gin, which is in 1793. Now, we said that the growth of manufacturing in the market economy, um, the growth of manufacturing in the market economy results in changes. And one of the changes that it results in is the distinction between home and work. Right? So we said, you know, look, people prior to industrialization and the growth of the market economy were self-sufficient. Right? But the transformation is increasingly self-sufficiency was given away to kind of a market economy. And um, you know, which led to a separation between home and work. Which also led to something that's, that's, that I mentioned. I don't think I mentioned this in all three classes, but I know I mentioned it. The cult of domesticity. The cult of domesticity 
was this kind of veneration of the, the role of a wife and mother as homemaker and as, as you know, kind of matron of the home. And the idea is that the mother and the wife, kind of their realm was the home, and that was a sanctuary for the man, you know, that he could leave the world of work and go back to home where things were safe and consistent and the children would be raised. The cult of domesticity, there's a lot of discussion about that. I mean, you know, there, there's, you know, if you read chapter 14 in your book, you know, they talk about the whole system of, of, uh, of manufacturing where they took these young girls from farms and put them in dormitories in these cities and then they worked in the factories for a couple of years and they earned money that was a dowry. Right, you know, a dowry. I mean, it used to be when you got married and you would have to bring to the marriage, the wife would have to bring to the marriage a certain amount of money that they called the dowry. My, my daughter got married this summer and she always, when I was paying for the wedding, she'd just say, take it out of my dowry. Well, I didn't have a dowry for her, so I had to take it out of my pocket. Right, you know, so, um, you know, um, um, you know, and she goes, I'll just take that out of my dowry. Okay, yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, they had that dowry there. So, so any, anyways, you know, these girls would work at these mills, and they called them the low girls. And it's, it's like the cult of domesticity. There's a lot of discussion whether this was like feminist or not. The, the, the low girls, L O L O W E L L, low, the low girls. Just low Massachusetts was one of the places that had. But if you look at your book under the cult of domesticity, they're going to talk about, you know, was this kind of oppressive for women, or was it liberating? Did it give them power, or did it, did it push them back, right? You know, and that's an interesting kind of discussion that's in, 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 your, in your book about that. So we, we, we talked about, or we didn't talk about the public domesticity, but one thing we did talk a lot about was the transportation revolution of that time period. And we said that the big east-west, west-east transportation innovations or railroads and canals. You know, railroads and canals, because remember, most rivers flow north-south. And when the steam engine comes along, the steamboat comes along, they can go south-north. But the connection between east-west is not the same, and canals first, and the Erie Canal in particular, which we argued is just inherently interested, and the kids were interested in it, was the big one, but the railroads replaced all the canals eventually. Now, um, after talking about that, and this is getting pretty close to where we are now, we started to talk about reform, right? And in our conversation about reform, we, we talked about the changes that were occurring in America, and, you know, globalization and regionalization of the American system, you know, and the idea of kind of a market economy and all the transformations that were there. And we said that these changes really kind of shatter people, shake them up, you know, look, look at all these changes that are there in society, all the, the problems that are coming from urbanization and industrialization, changing nature of the world. And we said it sets the stage for, for you know, op for anxiety, fear, and optimism, right? We can fix these things. We, we talked about this a lot. And we also said that some of the impulses that lead people to respond with reform to the problems that were there involve the romantic impulse that is manifested in things like transcendentalism, but also the second great awakening. And so the second great awakening is a big deal. You know, I mean, it's a series of religious revivals that occur across the country. In, in some places more than others, uh, largely by our uh, itinerant ministers. And the most famous of these itinerant ministers for the for the Second Great Awakening is yes, yes, Charles Finney, yeah. you know, who he preaches in in um, you know places to you know, big crowds and you know has thousands of converts. And remember we said that those converted by, by, by Finney, like Theodore de Rightwell, are going to believe that they have some kind of obligation to not only convert themselves to a better life, but to convert society to a better life, you know, to a better existence. And, 
and they're going to be inspired, like Theodore Dwight Well, to take action in, in things like, you know, um, slavery and abolition. And, you know, we talked about Dorothea Dix. And, and remember, you know, we said that Dorothea Dix is an example of someone whose reform was confined to, to kind of humanitarian impulses, you know, uh, uh, alleviating suffering. And in her case, it was those people that were mentally handicapped that were so poorly treated. And you know, her heroic efforts to, um, to, to, to build separate facilities for them where they could be treated with some level of dignity. Um, something that I didn't talk about in class, but there's a question I can test about good for you people, is the Hudson River School of Art. Now you might say, why, dear instructor, would you ask such a dumb question? Here's why. The AP loves the Hudson River School, right? I don't know why, but numerous AP tests have questions about the Hudson River School. You know, the Hudson River School, the artists in the school painted landscapes, right? You know, I mean, so, so if you think about it, you know, art reflects culture, and it reflects values, and it reflects distinctiveness. So what's distinctive about America? Well, it's bigness, it's broadness, it's, 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 you know, so these Hudson River schools are broad, sweeping landscapes, you know, that, that, that kind of scream opportunity and expansion, you know, and the kind of the values that Americans venerate. And as I said, we did talk about transcendentalism, and we talked about some of the, some of the, the great transcendentalists, and we mentioned two in particular. Ralph Waldo Emerson, who you are reading about in your uh, English class, and Henry David Thoreau. And what was the big publication by Thoreau that we said, you know, really becomes the, the, the kind of the basis for some you know, future reformers? And uh, um, anybody remember what did we say? Uh, yeah, go ahead. Oh, civil disobedience. Civil disobedience. Yeah. Civil disobedience. And remember Gandhi and Martin Luther King, we said, um, you know, might have uh, adopted that, you know. And so, so, okay, you know, those are questions that you might have found in chapter 15 in your text. And now we kind of get into that chapter 16, right, in your text. And, and, and like I said, in terms of that chapter 16, there are questions in there. Most of the things that we didn't talk about are about the influence and the existence of slavery in the South. The entire chapter is about life in the South. And so, you know, the chapter talks about the importance of cotton and the cotton gin. And it talks about Eli Whitley and the impact that cotton had on, you know, life and economy in the South. Now, one of the things that, that the, 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 the chapters are arguing, we would concur with, is that what comes out of it all is a leadership class in the South that are the plantation barons. Right? People that, that had large plantations that, that cultivated cotton right, in, in, in the South were really the, the, the political and social elite that dominated Southern society, particularly in the cotton states like South Carolina, right? this plantation elite. And there, there was tension. I mean, you know, I mean, slavery was very important to those people, obviously. I mean, their, their wealth was tied up in land and in slaves and in the, in the, in the production of cotton. And cotton was a lucrative cash crop. So it's, it's only kind of natural when they felt that that institution was threatened by abolition, you know, that they, they responded in the way that they did, you know. Um, but, but um, you know, the, the, uh, the, 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 the influence of them are, is, is, is significant, right? And then, you know, besides kind of the influence of that, there's, you know, discussions about the lives of slaves and what that was like and, you know, the preponderance of ownership, who owned the slaves, the profitability of, of slavery. You know, slavery in the South is going to kind of define it, right? It defines the South. I mean, immigrants don't go to the South. You know, we have the Irish and the Germans and other immigrants walking them out of the South. I mean, if you're Irish, how are you, you're an impoverished peasant, 
that is willing to work for, for low wages, well, no wages is always lower than no wages. You just can't compete with slave labor. Right? And you, you can't compete with slave labor. So the immigrants could not compete with slave labor, and the economy of the South was dominated by cotton. Right? You know, so the opportunity for the immigrants, you know, there were opportunities for immigrants to start cotton plantations. You know, so I mean, there was less immigration in the South, right? There was less economic diversity in the South. I mean, it could be argued that, that slavery held Southern economic development in, in back. You know, because of, of slavery, if slavery is going to degrade work. I mean, that's a, like a big problem. I mean, if you if, if slaves are letting people at work, they they only they are only working because they're fearful of not. You know, in a kind of economic incentive, they they're, they're being forced to work by the lash. You know, okay. Well, there are questions about that, and you should take a look at that. And then um, there are questions about abolition that we are talking about. Right? So, you know, in terms of abolition, I think you should be able to distinguish between, you know, the gradual emancip or, you know, gradual compensated emancipation with colonization. And what was the name of the organization that we mentioned today that was central to that? American Colonization, American Colonization Society, 1817, Liberia, 1822, Monrovia, the failure thereof that society to really encourage manumissions and I mean that was the idea. The idea is, oh okay, now that we have this, people will manumit their slaves and, 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 and allow them to go back to live in this in freedom in this in this colony. And at some level, you know, we'll be creating another free country in Africa and you know, you know, we'll remedy the, 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 the you know, taking these people from their homeland. But I don't know about that way. You know, I mean most of the people that went to Liberia were already free. You know, they were free here, and they, they were either forced to or they went there. And then, you know, we're going to distinguish that with um, the radical abolitionist movement that we associate with Garrison, and we associate that with the liberator. And we said that Garrison's liberator is going to be the, this in, kind of initial you know, reaction to, to slavery, they said that slavery is more evil. It's wrong, you know, and it should be stopped immediately without compensation. And then, you know, you probably should have some familiarity with some of the, the great, you know, abolitionist leaders, you know, Theodore Dwight Well, Wendell Phillips, and of course Frederick Douglass. You know, and Douglass is the author of the narrative, and he, he is the, he becomes really the most prominent African American. You know, eventually an advisor to the president, later first you know, American ambassador to Haiti. You know, Douglas is going to be a dominant and prominent, you know, um, member of the society of that. Uh, beyond that, I think that's that's going to kind of take us to the end. There's some things we'll talk about tomorrow that will be on the test, but not the entire period. Right? Most of the period tomorrow will be on things that are on the next. So those are the things that you might want to look at. Um, some of the questions on the test will be traditional questions, and then there'll be about maybe nine of them will have a text or, or a picture, and then tiered down questions, kind of the AP format, right? So you'll be able to read them and answer the question. Might be, might be the moment. I mean, I, I get the report. But there are ones that I think you should be able to answer. Okay. Anybody have any other questions? I mean, you have to take a small one. It was 35 minutes. Long. What was the uh, book by Thoreau called? Civil Disobedience. Civil Disobedience. Okay. Are right, you thinking about going up to make an application at Harvard University? You should, yes. Yeah. Well, there's a school of things in the painted landscape, that's how it is. I mean, I, I, I take a peek out of the little text, there's a painting out of the Well, Mr. Taylor showed a painting last year that. He's my own. Yeah, I know. He's